Welcome to Central Community. Thanks so much for being a part of our worship this morning. Thank you for joining us for the message. I hope that you will stay all the way through the end of the message. It has been a fantastic week. Thank you for those of you who support our ministries, whether it's our food distribution ministry, whether it's our orphanage in Tijuana, whether it's on the streets of Los Angeles, through this heat. It is such a blessing to be able to serve together, and you are invited to worship with us this morning. Join us, please. Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain, firm beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me when I am surrounded. Your love carries me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the goodness that you've blessed us with in our lives and our hearts. We thank you now we can come and we can worship and we can bow down before you as God, as Lord and Savior. And we thank you for your commitment to us. And as we are here, we thank you that you're listening to our hurts, our cries, our worries, our problems and the good things that are happening in our hearts and lives. And so, Father, we thank you for your guiding hand, no matter what comes our way today, no matter what came our way this week, you were there at every step of our journey. And so, Father, thank you for listening, being beside us, and guiding us throughout the week. And Father, whatever comes our way now, we know that you'll be there helping and guiding and protecting us. And so, Father, we thank you for your commitment to each and every one of us, that you call us your children. Father, you're wanting the best from all of us today. And when we fall short, you'll pick us up, you'll guide us, and you'll give us direction and purpose to the place that you want us to be. And so, Father, we thank you. And now, as we pray, we give you those things that worry us, we give you those things that we don't have answers or directions for and we want some answers and we would like some direction today and so father thank you that you're here helping and protecting us guide us now and not only ourselves but guide the world guide the world to where it needs to be with whether it's the united states of america or any other nation in this world help us to be able to do the right thing as a nation and as a body And Father, thank you for being with us and blessing us now. We thank you for your love and goodness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
the pleasures I've known And tell me, Lord, what did I ever do That was worth loving you And the kindness you've shown Lord, help me, Jesus I'm wasted, it's so help me, Jesus I know what I am Now Tell me, Lord, if you think there's a way I can ever repay all I've taken from you. And maybe, Lord, I can help someone else for what I've been through myself on my way back to I know what I am Now that I know That I need you so Help me, Jesus My soul's in your hand Help me, Jesus My soul Thank you so much, Corey. It's always fun to have Corey sing. I love it because from the first time I heard him sing, I began to introduce him to people that were singing. I mean, when he's, he's half my age, probably, Corey is, and I saying, have you heard Jerry Jeff Walker? Have you heard all these people? And I'm immediately thinking his voice is just perfect for all these people saying, who? You know? <laughs> and so I realized that when you're much older than that, it's a whole different dimension. We've been talking about seven simple disciplines from God for us to live by that we have the opportunity to imbue within our lives and to change who we are. We started off with the story of the, or actually last week we talked about the prodigal son, and in talking about the prodigal son, we talked about what it was like for strangers to walk by, or strangers, I mean sons of the father to come back and the father to reach out and how the story somehow became focused on this two boys as opposed to the loving father. And then the week before that, we talked about the Good Samaritan and how there was this Good Samaritan that had been rejected by so many in his community, and yet when there was a man in the ditch who was broken, the religious walked by the man in the ditch, and yes, the Samaritan went ahead and he stopped. And this morning we're going to go over another story of Jesus about a religious man, a Pharisee, and a tax collector, and how it impacted the people's lives, because we started off by talking about goodness. Last week, we talked about understanding, and this morning, I want to talk about self-control. Now, hardly any of us want to focus on self-control in our life. We like the results of self-control. We just don't want to live with self-control on a daily basis in our lives. And we all know that self-control is good for us. We just like to be out of control when we want to be. Without worrying about self-control, if there was a term that defines American culture, it's pretty much out of control. And how to live out of control. And so this story on self-control and drawing us close to God is important to each one of us on the back of the card that's on your screen this, or in your program this morning and on this screen as you come along from the Gospel of Luke, the 18th chapter, Jesus speaking. It says, Jesus told a story to some people 
who thought they were better than others and looked down on everyone else. Sadly, Jesus just described the church around the world today, not just in America, but around the world to so many people. He just described the church as it was 2,000 years ago. Some people who thought they were better than others, and they looked down on everyone else. It said two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a tax collector. In other words, these two guys, one of them was what the world would consider very religious, a leader. This was a guy who was in temple on a regular basis. He was a Pharisee, a theologian. He was someone that everyone paid attention to. The other one, not so much. He was a tax collector. He was someone who was known to work for the occupying government from Rome to collect taxes from people for the occupying government so that they could pay for their occupation. He was one who did it, and his pay came from taking as much tax as he could get from his fellow community members. He was a crook. He was as low as you could get in the community. Jesus is talking about one who in the community would be preserved, would be looked at, and perceived as one who's really good, and one who not so much. One who would be perceived as essentially a criminal. The Pharisee stood over by himself and he prayed, God, I thank you that I am not greedy, not dishonest, not unfaithful in marriage like other people, and I am really glad that I am not like that tax collector over there. I go without eating for two days a week, and I give you one-tenth of all I earn. This guy sounds pretty good. This guy sounds like a very religious guy. He sounds like he went to discipleship class, he learned all of his lessons, and he's playing it out on a daily basis, and he's still going to temple, and he's praising God that he's not like those other people over there. Sounds like there shouldn't be any kind of hook to this story. Then Jesus talks about the tax collector. The tax collector stood off at a distance and did not think he was good enough even to look up towards heaven. He was so sorry for what he had done that he pounded his chest and he prayed, God, have pity on me. I am such a sinner. This man looked at his life. He knew who he was. He was honest about it. He didn't think he even belonged in the temple. He didn't even think he could look to heaven. He pounded his chest and said, God, have pity on me. I am such a sinner. Now, from the world's perspective, if you looked at the two of them, obviously, the Pharisee is the one that you would think, oh, this guy's close to God. And the tax collector is the one you'd look at and say, yeah, don't want my kids running around with him. I don't even want to be near him. He doesn't even think he's good enough for God or good enough to be in the temple. Even he won't lift his eyes towards heaven. And Jesus closes the story with this. Then Jesus said, when the two men went home, it was the tax collector and not the Pharisee who was pleasing to God. If you put yourself above, above others, you will be put down. But if you humble yourself, you will be honored. How did it happen in the world that we got to a spot where it seems like if we exalt ourselves, that just makes us better? How did we get to a spot in the world where it seems like if we act like we have all the right answers, that just makes us better? If we act like we can check off everything we're doing, that just somehow makes us better. All through my 40s, I was a daily runner. Now, a daily runner amongst runners means that you don't miss a single day. I mean, 365 days a year for years I ran. And I don't mean, I mean, I averaged over six miles a day 
for years without missing a day in the heat and the rain. If we were in an area which I've run in blizzards, wherever I was at, I ran. I've run on fishing boats where I had to do 100 laps around a fishing boat. I've run in the parking lot of the forum where I was invited to a hockey game. And I said, oh man, I didn't get in my run today. And I said, go get the seats. And I've run out around the forum all by myself until I had my mileage in. It's stupid. But you see, to me, that made me better because I had, it wasn't something that was complex. It was a very simple thing to do, just putting one foot in front of the other every single day. But it also made me self-righteous. There's an old saying about runners. Um, don't bother to ask your running friends about their marathon because they'll tell you. And it's true. It's one of those things we do. And that's what this guy who went into the temple was like. This guy who went into the temple, he kept all of his disciplines just right. He was faithful in marriage. That's a good thing to be. He was giving his tithe. That's a good thing to do. He was faithful to God. That's a good thing to be. None of these things were bad things, except he was looking over at the tax collector who he considered a sinner. And he said, and most of all, God, I thank you that I'm not like that tax collector over there, a sinner. And he immediately was exalting himself and putting someone else down. Have you found yourself in that spot? At some point, have you found yourself the reason that you're better is because you're exalting yourself instead of waiting for God to exalt you? Have you found yourself because of your discipline, because of the way you've set yourself out? And it said the tax collector came in, he looked at everyone else and he thought, I don't even belong in this place. He looked at God who he desperately needed. I don't even deserve to lift my eyes towards heaven. And he simply beat his chest and said, God, forgive me. I'm such a sinner. I got a, I thought a credit card the other day, one of those offers that you throw away, but instead it said, because I'd gotten my physical at my doctor, which I did over the phone, I didn't even have to go into the doctor's office. You know how great it is to do a physical over the phone? The doctor says to you, how much do you weigh? And I say, I don't know, 155. I mean, you, you, you just immediately come up with whatever weight you want. You know, what's your blood pressure like? I don't know, 170 over six. You know, it's just, you know, you just make up the stuff as you go, and there's no way for him to measure what you're doing. I'm just, you know, all these numbers that you can just go through all on your own, and a week or so went by, and I get a thank you note in the mail this week. And it was, thank you so much for having your physical done, for keeping your appointment. I'm thinking, all I did was answer the phone when my doctor called, give some answers to the guy, and it says, here's a gift card for you. And I'm thinking, this has got to be a scam. So I called up, and I registered the gift card. And you know what it says? It says, to activate this card. And I'm thinking, oh, they're going to want some kind of information. From I got, it was a $50 gift card just for doing a physical. I'm thinking, I remember when I used to have to pay $1,500 a month for insurance. Now, just simply because I'm old, I mean, they're sending me $50 for just answering the phone call when my doctor calls and doing a physical over the phone. I thought, praise God from whom all blessings flow. But what I didn't think was, you know what? Look how good I am. What I didn't think was, look how much better I am than everyone else. What I thought instead is, wouldn't it be great if everyone had this kind of medical insurance? Wouldn't it have been great if I had had that kind of medical insurance when my children were little and we had it our whole lives? And the entire nation was filled with that kind of strength for health instead of just, yeah, once you're old, we know we don't have to cover you for much longer, so have 50 bucks and we hope we get to do this next year too. Activate it now because you don't have much longer to use that 50 bucks. Take it down and get some Geritol. I mean, for each of us, we go through the times where we can either exalt ourselves or we can begin to humble ourselves before God so that then God will exalt us. So on the front side of your card this morning, it says benefit number three is self-control and how to put others first. Because we don't focus much on self-control. 
And on self-control, if we do it by the way we eat, by the way we exercise, by the way we make sure we're at work on a regular basis, by the way we take care of us, the way we make sure we're in church on a weekly basis, as opposed to saying in self-control, I'm going to make sure I'm not exalting myself above others. I'm going to make sure that I'm not putting myself first. I'm going to make sure that God's first, that others are second, you know, that I'm last, that I'm making sure that this self-control is not putting self first in everything I say and in everything I do remember that the whole series of messages is coming from 2 Peter, the first chapter. There's a little card inside your program that looks like this this morning. Um, You can take it out. I trimmed mine so it fit inside my wallet. It also will fit inside your purse. Well, most people will fit inside your purse easily. It says seven simple disciplines from God. And it says, do your best to improve your faith. That's a big statement. Do your best to improve your faith. So how should I do my very best to improve my faith? Peter tells us, first of all, by adding goodness. That was our first week, two weeks ago. It's online. You can go check it out. By adding goodness. Second of all, by adding understanding. Third, by adding self-control. That's today what we're going to talk about. Fourth, patience. I wouldn't miss that one. Pastor Eric preaches on patience. That's a big deal. Well, I Believe me, that's when I'm at the altar before I get here. Patience. Fifth, by devotion to God. Sixth, by concern for others. Seventh, and love. And then it says, if you keep growing in this way, it will show that what you know about our Lord Jesus Christ has made your lives useful and meaningful. Do you want your life to be useful and meaningful? Or do you want to come to the end of your life, have them put a little stone on top of your grave, And it says, here lies Eric Denton, useless and meaningless. What an awful thing for us to have said about us. Useless, meaningless. And so the secret to this is not that big. Useful and meaningful for God right here in something small enough for you to hold on to. You don't even have to carry the whole Bible with you. You don't have to memorize the whole Bible. You could just utilize this and please God with our lives if we were to do that. So self-control is that third benefit we're covering. It says there are three doors. Our self-control opens to others and to God. First door is introspection. Introspection. Introspection just means looking within. Introspection just means self-examination. Introspection just means that we're not pointing out others, but instead We're taking account of ourselves long before we point out others. Introspection for spiritual growth, not judgment. And I'm really glad that I'm not like that tax collector over there. I'm really glad that I'm not like that tax collector over there. You see, this guy knew exactly who he thought was a sinner. This guy knew exactly what he thought should be happening going on. Maybe like me, you're on social media, but this week, as the Roe versus Wade decision came down, my social media exploded with both sides of the opinion. Every part of the opinion coming down in particular, but one part in particular that I really appreciated was a friend of mine who I grew up with who happens to be Jewish. He's Jewish to the point that, I mean, his son-in-law is a rabbi, his daughter is a cantor at some of the great synagogues in um, Southern California. And he posted what their rabbis made a statement about on it. And he was proud that he was a part of the synagogues that he was in. He was proud that he was, and lots of people were affirming him with agreeing statements, and then one person a kid that we've known all the way back to being ch- kids, little kids, posted, I don't know what you guys are talking about. You guys, And then suddenly, everyone was just calling this guy that they've known for decades all kinds of names. And it was awful. Said, I don't understand what you're talking about. Why am I getting so much grief for my disagreement? And this is what my friend who had posted, what his rabbis put, he just simply posted, I want you to know that within the Jewish tradition and Levitical scripture, 
We prioritize the life of the mother. And that's all I'm saying. I don't mean to have anything bad going on with you. And I thought, what a healing statement. What a statement to say, this just, I don't want to cause a fight with you. Is it easy to get in a fight with people? Is it easy to find people who disagree with you? Is it easy to find people who want to say, wait a second, I think this, wait a second, I think this, and then we take our separate camps and we want to just be a battle with each other? Instead of saying, you know, wait, I just want you to understand where I'm coming from. I, I don't want to be at battle with you. Our relationship is more important than that. For us to be able to lay claim to say, you know what, this relationship we have with God, it's not about me being in charge, it's about God being in charge. And do we need occasionally to have self-control when we enter into these relationships? Absolutely. That requires introspection. I love the quote. It says, feelings are more dangerous than ideas because they aren't susceptible to rational evaluation. They grow quietly, spreading underground, and erupt suddenly all over the place. Have you ever had those kind of feelings before? Those feelings that were just lurking underneath? They grew quietly, and then suddenly there was that one thing that erupted suddenly and just spilled out all over all of your relationships. You said the wrong thing. You did the wrong thing. You just erupted. And suddenly, people didn't want to talk to you. You were alienated from folks. Feelings. It requires this introspection so that we're able to say something in a positive fashion just to express where we're coming from and let people know. Second, secondly, um, self-control and how to put others first, the second door that self-control opens to others in God is contrition. Contrition. Contrition is um, synonymous with confession. It's synonymous with those words where we have to go down and lay down our own needs. Contrition, without looking to blame anyone else. And I've talked about, you know, how we so often try to blame someone else for whatever is going on in our lives without activating our faith. That, that simple card that we have within us, where we've got that number that we need to call on God and say, God, activate this gift that you've given me. And it begins with contrition without looking to blame anyone else. What did the tax collector do? He said, God, have pity on me. I am such a sinner. Did it say, God, please take care of that Pharisee because he's such a hypocrite? Did it say, God, please take care of this temple because they rarely even let me in? God, please take care of my neighbors who hold me at arm's length because they don't love me and they think I'm a sinner? No, it was just one person with personal contrition going before God, asking for mercy. Please, Lord, have mercy on me. I am such a sinner. It says God is not looking for repayment, but repentance. What heals a broken relationship is sincere love and contrition. Imagine facing judgment and having lots of broken relationships. Not because of the other people, just the other people were just being who they are. But you broke off their relationships because of who they were. And then standing before God, justifying all those broken relationships and God looking at you and saying, wait a second, my son came to a cross to show you the way and said, Unless you lift up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy to be called my disciples. For us, we need to remember that these relationships that we're in in this world are of so much more value and worth than our disagreements. Even between the Pharisee and the tax collector, I didn't make up this story, Jesus did. Jesus told this story so that we would begin to understand the value of self-control when what we want to do is break off and just separate. And all of us are guilty 
of those moments where we just break off and we separate. I have been supremely guilty in this regard. I have been supremely guilty of thinking, oh yeah, this person's not in my life anymore. Just write them off as dead. Why? Because it's easier. It's easier just to pretend. I had an old friend that I had been thinking about. I told Debbie, you know, I've been thinking about this old friend. She said, Why don't you try to look her up, see if she's on social media? So I did. I tried to look. She's been dead for more than a decade. And I had ended our friendship poorly, and now there's no way to reconcile anything like that. Dead for more than a decade. And the only one who's accountable for not ever just saying, hey, you know what, I'm sorry that our friendship in it badly is me. That's it. For each of us, we go to that spot where contrition before God, confession before God without looking to blame anyone else is honest. God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. I'm not even worthy of looking my, lifting my eyes up to heaven, God. Please, God, have mercy on me. And then the third door, our self-control opens to others and to God. Because remember, if you can't be open to others, don't expect yourself to be open to God. Because those who you see and talk to every single day, so much easier than God who you can't see, and you rarely hear his voice in your heart and your life. And that's not me making that up or just being clever. That's a scripture. For us, we need to understand that to get along with those that we can see and we are around is the first step to getting along with God. These relationships are essential. So the third door, our self-control opens to others and God, is grace. Grace that flows through humility. That's 100% unmerited. Grace that flows through humility. That's 100% unmerited. What unmerited mean? It just means you couldn't do anything to earn it. You couldn't tithe often enough. You couldn't go to church often enough. You couldn't fast often enough. You couldn't be good enough ever for the grace of God. God's grace is given to us as a gift because God loves us. And because God loves us, all we need to do is open our arms to receive that relationship, to receive that gift. But when we receive that gift of grace, that means it needs to transform us to be those people who are no longer judgmental, who are no longer hypocritical, who are no longer people who are just thinking about how much more we can get, but instead filled with introspection and thinking, how in the world can I be better? It says, if you put yourself above others, you will be put down. But if you humble yourself, you will be honored. If you humble yourself, you will be honored. A friend of mine who I talk to on the phone regularly, I have different friends that I have different days of the week that I talk to them on. And so I just measure, and so this person is this day of the week, this person is this day of the week. And I, it's, it's a simple way for my routine to keep people in my life. I've known this guy since we were 14 or 15. I was talking to him a couple of weeks ago, and I told Debbie, you know, so-and-so, it seems like his memory is slipping a bit. Out of the clear blue, I got a call on a day that I don't talk to this friend on a regular basis, me and my routines. I would make a good Pharisee in that regard, believe me, for as far as my routines go. Um, and we talked for about an hour or so. And then I talked to Debbie, it just seems like his memory is slipping. He says, what, like he doesn't remember names? No, you know how it's just in a conversation? And my concern was legitimately deep. I love this friend. And I thought about how quickly life goes by. And I thought about how essential just a little card like this can be to us at a time like this to remind us how in the world do we receive this grace through humility? And then how do we allow that grace to flow through us on the other side of the card from Isaiah 58? There are simple ways to put this to work in our lives. It says, I'll tell you what it really means to worship the Lord. 
Remove the chains of prisoners who are bound unjustly. Free those who are abused. Share your food with everyone who is hungry. Share your home with the poor and homeless. Give clothes to those in need. Don't turn away your relatives. Does that take humility to do all that? Does that take personal introspection to be willing to do all that? Yep. Does that take God's grace to continue to welcome your relatives into your home? And to do, yeah, absolutely. But you see, it's impossible once we receive just these simple instructions on the little card to go to God at the end of the day and say, I didn't know any better, God. On one simple card that will fit in your wallet or your purse. Really everything you need to lead a godly life. Right there. We can't say, well, I couldn't read the whole Bible. Well, right there on this one card that we can share with someone, but even more importantly, that we can take to ourselves and we can say, God, I need more of that kind of self-control. Have you been exalting yourself? Have you been making yourself feel better by making other people feel worse? Life's not a competition. Life's an invitation to following the love of Christ Jesus. Life's not a competition. You don't win because you have the most junk at the end of the day. At the end of the day, you just got a whole bunch of junk. Life's an invitation to celebrate the grace that God's given you from the moment that you were born, that we have the opportunity to ar have our arms open and receive, and then to take that on and say, God, give me self-control so that I can learn how to put others first. Tuesday, it was really hot. It was really hot, and they were packing all the food for distribution. Sherry came to me, and then Lynn came to me, and they said, next Tuesday, we don't have nearly enough people to be here packing food, Pastor. If you could tell some people that we need some help at 9 o'clock Tuesday morning to pack food. And I thought about their hearts. They're here every single week, and they're worried about the next week, already thinking out ahead. Wednesday morning, it was really hot out on the parking lot. I know because I'm rarely out there to do anything. Pastor Kane was on vacation, and so I was out there filling in, and Josh told me where to stand, and I stood there across from Mike, and Mike and I worked. Mike was sweating, I was sweating. We were filling cars with stuff. And I thought, man, next week we need some more people out here because today it's supposed to be, what, 104 or something like that, or 103? Wednesday it's supposed to be hot as well, out on the parking lot as we fill cars. And I thought, what does that take? All it takes is the invitation to say, I want to take my time to remember that there are people in need, greater need than I'm in, and I want to put them first, ahead of me, have some self-control in this regard. We have the invitation on a daily basis to say, God, help me to serve you in all I say and in all I do. There's a simple prayer at the bottom of the card this morning. It says, self-control to your glory. Hasn't been my strong point, Lord. Forgive me. Help me not to focus on the weaknesses of others, but to work on growing closer to you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, God, for a faith that's a gift straight directly from your throne, the gift of grace, the invitation to living a life that we can humble ourselves, God, and the joy of what it means to coming into your presence and sharing with others, not in judgment, but in love, God. I would ask for each one of us in a world that's so divided, in times that we have so many difficulties and struggles that we can simply become a people who explain ourselves, not with judgment, not with one better than the other, but just with the sharing in love, God. That we might protect our relationships, God, through your grace and your love, and that you might come, Holy Spirit, and that you might remind us just how important these relationships were to you from the very beginning. 
I would ask your grace would flow out through us today for every household watching this morning, for every individual. Holy Spirit, that you would move right now. For everyone present, that you would just touch our hearts, God, that you would give us a kind of self-control that doesn't make us feel self-righteous or better than, but instead a self-control that draws us close to you and then close to others because we remember where we've been, God. We thank you for being a healing and a loving Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us this morning online and here in person. This evening we're going to the streets of Los Angeles. It is going to be hot. It is going to be hot here in the kitchen, but if you would like to come out and help, I know Jody's cooking bratwurst tonight. They're making sandwiches. They've got, I'm sure, something to go with the bratwurst and those kinds of things. You're invited to come and be a part of that. It's going to be fun to give them away tonight. If you would like to come to the streets of LA with us tonight, we will be leaving the church at 7.30. If we have too many people, you're invited to caravan down with us. We will show you the way to go. It's a good time and you're welcome to be a part of that. Tuesday morning, both Sherry and Lynn and several other people had told me, I don't remember who was gonna be gone, but some folks were gonna be gone. If you would like to come out and help pack food with our food packing team, they are some of the best people that you will ever meet. And I don't promise that it'll be easy. I don't promise you won't work hard. I don't promise that you won't sweat. You will, but you have the opportunity to be a part of all of that just by coming out Tuesday morning and working with them. You're invited to do that. Wednesday morning, our food distribution team will be out on the asphalt in the heat. We try our very best to start a little bit early when it's really hot like that. So we'll be starting probably by eight o'clock or so but they'll be out in there until 10 o'clock giving away food. Most importantly, if you need food, if you know someone who needs food, don't hesitate to come out, get in your car and come through line and get food for your family member, your friends, your neighbors who may need it. But if you need a place to serve, you're invited to come and do that. Wednesday afternoon, I'll be down at Siempre para los Niños, our orphanage in Tijuana. You are invited to pray for that, to be a part of that. Um, we have got lots of staff transitions going on down at Siempre, so please keep the children in your prayers as we go through all of these different challenges. This is always to be expected, but across the decades that we've been working in Mexico, we've learned that it's just not easy working in a foreign country, so if you would please pray for the children down there. May God richly bless you and your household as we continue to worship together in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Take my life. 